Pell Mell Famous Cigarettes present The Big Story. Frankie. Frankie, where are you? Never listens. Never around when I want him. Frankie! In the shed again. Someday he'll do something terrible. I know it. Get out. Didn't you hear me call you? Get out of here. Leave me alone. What are you doing now? What crazy thing? What's in that box? I told you, leave me alone. If you ever come in the shed again, Pa, if you ever come sneaking in on me again, if you ever ask me again what I'm doing or what's in this box, so help me, I'll brain you. I'll take your hammer and I'll brain you to death. The Big Story. Here is America. Its sound and its fury, its joy and its sorrow, as faithfully reported by the men and women of the great American newspapers. Dateline, Louisville, Kentucky. The story of a boy, a misfit of 16, a frightened boy who killed out of fear. To reporter Al Aronson of the Louisville Courier-Journal, for his excellent work in this case, goes the Pell-Mell Award for the big story. Of all America's leading cigarettes, only one is outstanding. Only one is outstanding. It's the longer, finer cigarette, Pell-Mell. Discover for yourself why so many of your friends have changed to Pell-Mell. Pell-Mell's greater length filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. That's important. Yes, Pell-Mell's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. Thus, Pell Mell gives you a smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. So enjoy the longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Pell Mell. Pell Mells are good. Good to look at, good to feel, good to taste, and good to smoke. Pell Mell famous cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. the story as it actually happened. Reporter Al Aronson's story as he lived it. Louisville, Kentucky. You didn't know about it, Al Aronson, reporter for the Louisville Courier-Journal. No one on the paper knew about it, but it would electrify you and all of Louisville within an hour. It happened, this frightening, pathetic thing that'll live with you the rest of your life. It happened just across the river from Louisville in New Albany, Indiana. Six miles from where you sat, enjoying your breakfast. It began in the first farmer's bank, corner of Easton Maple, in New Albany. Henry Easton, the bank teller, said to Ernest Thornton, the cashier... Hey, Ernie, look at that limousine just pulling up. Must be a half a block long. What a car. Let me get here. Who is it? Don't know. Must be a new depositor. Every chauffeur with him. Some star. Here they come. It's a kid. Some rich man's son, probably. No. No, it isn't, Henry. That isn't any... He's got a... He's got a gun. Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams. Shut up. Stand still. All of you stand still. Where's Adams? Where's the president of this bank? No. No, what is this? Surely... Shut up and turn around. Are you Adams? Yes, I'm Mr. Adams, Turn around and walk to the vault. You don't think you can... You think I'm kidding? You think I don't mean it? All right. You refuse to go to the vault? I do, and I urge you... Who's the question? Okay. Who else refuses to go to the vault? Come on, talk! Oh? Okay. 
You lead me there. Should we rush him? He'll kill us. Even so, I think... Talking. Yeah. Whispering. Good. Uh, uh, no, don't! You, chauffeur. Yes, sir? Go out in the car and start the motor. Yes, sir. Get, can't take this place now. There's too much noise. You're going to drive me where I want to go until I'm ready to come back. Holding the gun before him, the kid... One dead man thought he was a rich man's son. Another dead man thought he could be rushed. And a third dead man thought he could be urged. The kid, he was 16, forced the liveried chauffeur into the sleek limousine and drove away. And that was all anybody saw or heard that morning. Three dead, a 16-year-old murderer escaped. You get the story. You... Youthful, serious, an eye for every detail, Al Aronson. The first lead, 12 hours after the attempted robbery and triple murder, came from a hospital bed in New Albany just across the river. A man with perhaps an hour to live. A man with a hole through his chest made by a 45. The liveried chauffeur, George Murphy. Uh, uh, Now, don't uh, raise your voice, George. I can hear you fine. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Was like I told you, sir. He picked me up sitting in the car about 9.30 in the morning. In Louisville, that was? Yes, sir. I drive for Mr. Norton at the steel plant. Mm-hmm. Made me drive across the bridge. The bridge. Oh. Is it bad, George? No, it's not too bad, sir. Made me drive up to the bank. He knew that bank, too, sir. So says nobody will be in there now, just a... Yes, here, the teller and the president. He was right, wasn't he? Yes, sir, that's right. He got there, kept the gun in my side, and made me go in with him. He killed them three men, made me go out and drive them away. Mister, I tried to turn him in. How do you mean, George? Well, I tried to mix him up, turning corners and twist and so on. I tried to pull him into the police station, but well, he knew the town, told me. Turn down here, turn down there, all, all the time, keeping away, away from... Now, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Take it easy, George. Yeah, sir. Well, all the time, he keep me from driving to the police station. New alleys I, I didn't have no myself. And, and made me go down near the riverfront. It was a little blind alley I never did see before. And that's the way, the way he done it to me. Said to me, you might keep your mouth shut, but... I'm making sure. And then he shot you? Yes, sir. He stuck the gun right next to my chest and pulled the trigger. Had a smile on his face. He he was mean, mister. Bad mean. No more than 16. Real mean. What uh, what did he look like? Oh, big fella, 6'1", 6'2". Only 16 or 17, the most. Pimples on his face and a foul tongue, sir. I tell you, foul. Cuss his own mother. Ever see him before? Mm, no, sir. But but the way he knew them streets, knew where to turn, knew the bank, he must, must be a local boy, I figure. But... George. Maybe... maybe George. <laughs> George. You take the theory given to you by the heroic Negro chauffeur who tried to steer the car to the police station. You take his idea that this was a local boy, and there are no other clues, to the cops. Lieutenant Edmonds listens, lights up a cigar, but he's chewing. No, a local boy couldn't be, couldn't be. But, but he knew the town from the chauffeur's description. He knew it as well as you. I know every hoodlum in this town, every one of them. Killer isn't here. There's nine kids, maybe ten, who fit that description. I checked every one. They didn't do it. But if you'd heard the chauffeur, Lieutenant, if you'd heard Look, what he said... Look, you're a bright reporter. Answer me this. He wants to do a hole-up in New Albany. Why does he go over the bridge to Louisville, get the car, force the chauffeur all the way back here, and then do the hold-up? Does that make sense? No, but it still could have... nothing. That was a local New Albany boy. I'd have him in the coop and halfway up for sentencing. Try something else. Lieutenant Edmonds knows New Albany, knows its hoodlums, its racketeers, knows what he's talking about. But you are Al Aronson and stubborn and a man with an eye for facts. 
And you don't easily shake the sight of the dead chauffeur, George Murphy, from your mind. Or his words. So, you start looking. In dives, in pool rooms, in the sordid places having no others. That young hoodlums gather. But always... I never heard of nobody look like that. Pimples. Ah. Always the wise guy grin, the gag, and the shaking of the head. And then... A thought. A kid who knew the town that well must have lived here. Maybe he moved. Moved, that's it. Lived here and moved. You go to the movers in town. There are six. The first four know nothing about it. The description means nothing. But the fifth... A mean kid, dark-haired, pimples. Real low-down mean kid. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah, I moved him to Louisville. Him and his old man. Uh, what was his name? I'll never forget him. Said he'd help me with a crate. A big crate. Kind of a piano crate. But no piano in it. Mm-hmm. When I had it up, he let it... Well, he let go his end. near busted my leg. I could have killed him. But his old man was there. Uh, what was their name? Uh, Jensen or Henson. Something like that. Uh, Benson. Benson, yeah. Frankie Benson. A real mean little rat with a foul mouth. An all-American punk. You find the home of the mean, foul-mouthed kid in Louisville. A seedy two-room shack, kitchen and bedroom, a little shed in the back, where a tired, beaten old man listens to you. And before you're half through... It's him. Don't say no more. It's him. Four men killed, you said? That's right, Mr. Benson. Sooner or later, it had to be. Now it happened. A son. A man slaves a whole life for a boy. His mother died eight years ago. I never married again. Who'd marry me? And this. I knew it. I knew it. It had to happen. Has he uh, been around since? When did he do it? Tuesday. Today's Thursday. Yesterday, he disappeared. No, no, Thursday. Today he disappeared. Today. Excuse me if I'm a little mixed up on the days. Of course, sir. You've no idea where he went. Away, that's all he said. Away. Except the note. Now it comes to me. The note, what it meant. What note, Mr. Benson? He left me a note. I'll get it. If I tell you, you won't believe me. Step inside. Into here. Here is the only other room. The bedroom. He opens a closet where rags hang and one decent suit of clothes. And in a pocket, he finds a piece of crumpled paper, cheap note paper with lines in it. And in childish handwriting is a note. Read it. Read it. You wouldn't believe it otherwise. This is his writing? His. Stop me. Stop me, please, before I do it again. That was after he murdered them. Four men. Ah, it's awful. Mister, do you, do you think you can find him? Do you think you can stop him? Before he does it again? Before he does it again. I can try. We've got to. Mr. Benson, we... We just got to. We'll be back in just a moment with tonight's big story. Pell Mell famous cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. For Pell Mell's greater length filters the smoke on the way to your throat, filters the smoke, and makes it mild. That's important. Yes, Pall Mall's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. Your eyes can see Pall Mall's greater length. Yes, your eyes can see the difference. Your throat can tell you what it means. Pall Mall's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos means a longer, natural filter to screen and cool the smoke. Thus, Pell-Mell gives you a smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Enjoy the longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package, Pell-Mell. Pell-Mells are good. Good to look at, good to feel, 
Good to taste and good to smoke. Remember, Pell-Mell's greater length of fine tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. Pell-Mell famous cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. This is Cy Harris returning you to your narrator and reporter Al Aronson's story as he lived it and wrote it. It's only a few minutes since a father admitted that his son is a murderer. To you, Al Aronson, reporter for the Louisville Courier Journal. Just the short time since a father showed you the fear in his heart and the terror and desperation in his sons. A boy of 16 who feared he'd kill and kill again unless he was stopped. You sit now in the bare kitchen on a rickety chair and listen to the history of this boy, this mean, foul-mouthed boy, waiting for a clue that might tell you where to find him. He was bad since he was ten. A week after his birthday, he stole a knife and tried to cut one of his friend's fingers off. I stopped him. Why did he do it? A lot of reasons. He was bad. His mother was dead. I I saw him only a few hours a week. I worked the only work I could get out of town. He lived like a... like a wild animal. In the streets, in the gutters. Don't blame yourself, Mr. Benson. Blame? Blame? I don't blame anyone. I tell you only the facts. He stole. Twice he was caught. Twice. A year in the reform school each time. And how'd he come out? Worse. You know about reform schools. If he was wild before he went in, when he came out, he was sly. A fox, a wolf, waiting for his chance. Small boys he tortured, tied them up, things he saw in the movies he did to them. Like the Indians and and, in some of the magazines he read. Where he got them, I don't know. I know what happens to kids sometimes. Kids? He was bigger than me. Four inches bigger. Weighed 170 pounds. If I asked him to come into the house to work, maybe I raised my voice. He hit me. Many times he knocked me down. And at night... (laughs) At night... I don't understand. No one would understand. At night he slept with a gun. A gun. A forty-five. I saw it once. A gun under his pillow. We gotta find him to stop him to... to take care of him. Mr. Benson, you you say he just disappeared the day after the killings. The boxer. I didn't tell you about the box. That's right, the the day after the killings. What box? I don't know. Maybe it ain't important. It was to him. He said he'd bring me once if I interfered. He would have, too. He... he got a piano crate somewheres. Brought it into the shed. This is when we lived in New Albany before we moved. And fixed it up. He called it camping out. You know, he'd he'd get in the box and spend a whole day there. Never come out. Even eating there. Maybe it's just a child's game. I don't know. Maybe lots of kids do things like that. Why uh, did you mention the box, Mr. Benson? Because the day before he disappeared, the only thing he said to me... This was after he killed those men. He said, I'm leaving money for the box. Ship it to Knoxville. Knoxville? Where he got the money from, I don't know. He he never worked a day in his life. I didn't give it to him. Where in Knoxville? General delivery. I I remember because he said, here's the money. Don't write down the address. Remember it. General delivery, Knoxville. And you sent it? Shouldn't I have? Uh, No, I'm only asking. I sent it... Yesterday. About noon. A railway express? Yeah. Have you got the receipt? Yes. Give it to me. Why? What? Just uh, maybe nothing, but give it to me. You checked the neighborhood. No one saw Frankie leave town. That said, you go to the police, to Lieutenant Edmonds, who once before told you your theory was cracked. 
Say that again, Aronson. I don't think my hearing's that bad. I said this kid sent a packing crate out of town to general delivery in Knoxville, and I want to investigate that crate. What are you trying to prove? Well, nothing. I want your cooperation to find out where that crate is and see what's inside of it. Is that going to tell us where little Frankie is? It might. What did he do, leave a note inside and say you'll find me at the wall of Astoria in New York? I don't know what we'll find, but from what his father said, this kid's been bad a long time. This kid's been bad since he was born. Now, look, let's not fight about it. All I want is an order to stop the crate, examine it... Look, I play hunches, long shots. I'm screwy. But not this screwy. Uh, who found out where Frankie lived? Okay. Uh, who said he couldn't possibly be a local boy? Okay. Maybe I am that screwy. Hennessy, get the railway express on the phone. We want to trace a crate shipped to Knoxville. That's the warehouse, Lieutenant. That big one? Yes, sir. Warehouse 3. The crate's in Section D. Want me to go in with you? What for? To check a crate? I'm a big boy. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Got a flashlight? What's the matter? No lights in there? No, sir, Lieutenant. It's only a warehouse. I got a flash, Lieutenant. Prepared for anything, eh? Yeah? Yes, sir, Lieutenant. There's Section D. Must be down there. Yeah. Can, can you see all right? What the devil are you whispering about? I don't know. What are you whispering for? Oh, shut up. I'm sorry. You know, this crazy idea of yours is getting me. I know. Me too. Wait a minute. There it is, I think. Let's see. Over here's the address. Yeah, General Delivery, Knoxville. Uh, mm-hmm. Same handwriting. What handwriting? Same as on the note. I told you about the note. Yeah. What now? Let's, uh, let's look a little. Stop whispering. Uh, look. What? Holes, about six... Oh, eight holes in the top, same on the side, and this side, too. So what? I think they're air holes. What are you talking about? He's inside the kid. I tell you, he's in that box. You're nuts. Watch. I brought a candle. I'm going to light it. And while it's burning, it'll go inside the Wait. box. What for? Don't light it, Chet. Back up a little. Benson? You're in that box, you crazy kid. Come out. You're in there. Kick on the side of the box. Did you hear me? Listen. Kick up your inside that box. Go ahead. Light the candle. Watch out, you don't. Okay. I hate to do this, but I'm going to wiggle it around. No! He's in there. Get back. Get back, you dirty cowards. I got a gun. So help me if you don't leave me alone. Come out, Vincent. Come out. I haven't got a chance. Watch it. Stay away. What are you doing? The only thing we can do. I'm going to roll the crate over. Watch out. I'll help you. Okay. Together now. Roll it. Yeah. You'll never get me, you lousy flat foot. Never. Never. But never is a long time. And after three more turns of the crate, there's silence inside. No more shots. No more despairing threats. And then you and the lieutenant open it up. And out comes the mean, foul-mouthed boy of 16 who did all these things, these unspeakable things. Robbery, assault, brutality toward his father, murder. He comes out and asks two questions. Can you tell me why I did it? Can you? Can you help me, mister? Can you? And then... He collapses. And in the end, after the arrest, after the confession, you and his beaten, aged father examine the box, his camping out place, and you find... Look, like a Pullman compartment he fixed it with a bed. He could sleep here a day, two days. Mm-hmm. He had containers under the seat. This one is water and... This is for food. A lantern. Look, mister. A lantern. I see. And, and matches and a waterproof case. A knife. Three more guns. He had quite an arsenal. The magazines. 
Look at all the magazines. And then, something that rings your heart, that touches everything and colors it. Mr. Benson, look. The black hat, the black shirt, black pants, and a mask to wear over his eyes, and false black whiskers. <laughs> Write the story, Al Aronson. The case is finished, the killer found. But when you're done, the bigger story is left unwritten, unsaid. Whose fault? Who's to blame? How does it happen in this year of our Lord, 1949, that a boy of 16 could murder four men, ship himself to Knoxville, and carry with him an arsenal, loaded guns and a mask with false whiskers. In just a moment, we'll read you a telegram from Al Aronson of the Louisville Courier-Journal with the final outcome of tonight's big story. Of all America's leading cigarettes, only one is outstanding. Only one is outstanding. It's the longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package, Pell Mell. For Pell Mell's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. Thus, Pell Mell gives you a smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction. No other cigarette offers you. So enjoy the longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package, Pell Mell. Pell Mells are good. Good to look at, good to feel, good to taste, and good to smoke. Pell Mell famous cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. Now we read you that telegram from Al Aronson of the Louisville Courier-Journal. Further examination of crate used as hideout by killer in tonight's big story revealed that one side of it was so hinged that it could be locked or opened from the inside. He had also provided straps to hold himself and his provisions steady while in transit. News of his capture so aroused citizens of New Albany, Indiana, that police were compelled to transfer him to Indiana Reformatory at Jeffersonville. Tried for murder, he was sentenced to life imprisonment in the state penitentiary. Thanks a lot for tonight's Pell-Mell Award. Thank you, Mr. Aronson. The makers of Pell-Mell famous cigarettes are proud to have named you the winner of the Pell-Mell $500 Award for notable service in the field of journalism. Listen again next week, same time, same station, when Pell-Mell famous cigarettes will present another big story. A big story from the front pages of the Jacksonville Journal. Byline, Lee Cully. A big story about an abandoned school a weird old man, and a witch who walked in the night. The Big Story is produced by Bernard J. Proctor with music by Vladimir Selinsky. Tonight's program was written by Arnold Pearl. Your narrator was Bob Sloan, and James McCallion played the part of Al Aronson. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed, with the exception of the reporter, Mr. Aronson. This is Ernest Chappell speaking for the makers of Pall Mall Famous Cigarettes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.